Welcome to How to Write Good. I am your host, Daniel Poppy. You can find out more about me at danielpoppy.com. Poppy is spelled P-O-P-P-I-E. There's really no way to spell Daniel. It's kind of like um, the artist formerly known as Prince. You know, he was a symbol at some point. Is Prince alive? I think he's dead now, but maybe he's still alive. You know, Prince had a symbol for a while for his name. We still call them Prince, but whatever. You know, you can do that. You cannot do that. Uh, at my website, you can find my book, The Ninth Hour. It is the first book in an adventure series, uh, kind of along the same it's within the fantasy genre, I would say, but it's not fantasy. It's not high fantasy. It's something else. So check it out. See if you like it. And uh, you might. You might. Because everybody has a different a different thing they like. And uh, you might just, just pick it up. I would encourage you to read the first, even just the first chapter. You know, Pick it up, read the first chapter. If you want to go on, you can. If you, if you think it's a waste of your time, there you go. Uh, or if you want something free, you know, that's 99 cents. Or if you're someone who always wants the book, it's a bit more because it's a physical copy. Um, but that's 99 cents. If you don't want to pay the 99 cents, you can always go to my website. You can check out my serialized novel, One Last Toast for Ebenezer Fleet. That is in a podcast form and a written form. So you can go to my website, go to my blog. You can click on One Last Toast for Ebenezer Fleet on the side and every single chapter will come up there. Uh, and again, if you are even too lazy to read, you can always just listen to it. But you have to listen to my voice, which I don't know. It's kind of a trade off there. So check those out. I would have greatly appreciate it if you if you even just did that, if you're interested at all and you've just thought about it. And we're going to jump into our word of the week, which is consanguinous. Consanguinous. And for those of you savvy people, uh, those of you who hear the word well enough, through my garbled speech, uh, that word has sanguine in it, which is, it refers to a personality trait. So I think that um, if I get this right, because I don't have it right in front of you, but a sanguine personality trait is like outgoing and friendly and uh, upbeat, essentially. And sanguine also refers to blood, right? Uh, I believe it was, um, it was, it's a personality type, but it also referred to blood or bloodiness. And so you have the word sanguine, which is blood, and then you have the word con in the front of it. And what I always learned for con is it means with or something to the effect of with so uh the meaning of consanguinous uh actually i think it's consang wait consanguinous consanguinous i guess i was saying it correctly it threw me off a little bit is of the same blood or origin or descended from the same ancestor so it makes sense with blood and then it's the ending in s um so of the same blood or origin descended from the same ancestor useful word to know uh, you might actually run into it with medical stuff maybe i don't really know because i'm not a doctor so uh, i would know nothing about that we're going to be talking about uh for our accidental lessons we're going to be talking about a topic that i come back to once in a while i think every six months maybe every year i come back to this topic maybe a little less than a year in some cases in this case but it's a what makes good art and um, you could lump pretty much any other, there's a lot of other, um, there's a lot of other questions you could lump under this. You could say, what makes good writing? What makes a good story? What makes good music? What makes good, um, what makes good painting? Like, what is it, what is it, when there is a good painting, what makes it good? What makes a good sculpture? Different things like that. Um, and we're all, we're of course always looking at it from well we're looking at it from a bigger perspective but then we're looking at it from a perspective of writing itself because that's what I do and that's what I know best so I'm always going to address it that way but what makes good art is a question that I I always have trouble answering and once in a while I'll, I'll ask the question and I'll get somebody who is automatically sure of, of what they know and I think if you know what makes good art? Well, first of all, have you made any good art? Because if you know what makes good art, and um, if you're like, so for example, if I know what makes good writing, I should be able to make good writing. Does that make sense? So uh, I know I have the knowledge of what is good and what is bad, but I also know what it takes to get there as well. And that's what I mean by what makes good art, um, what is good, what is bad, and also what, what does it mean to, uh, what does it take to actually get to that point of being good art? So for good writing, I know what good writing is. And um, I know what good writing is because I know, it's, it's not just because I know the pieces, 
of good writing. It's because I know uh, I'm well acquainted with writing. I'm well acquainted with how people talk and how people write, right? <laughs> uh, I'm well acquainted with how people talk, how people write, how the language works. Maybe not. I'm not the best at doing that, but at the same time, I've been exposed to it a lot, right? Um, but at the same time, I have a hard time defining it. So I run into people who are like, oh yeah, this is what makes good art. And I'm just like, you know, that doesn't really work. That doesn't really fit um, what I know about writing or what I like. So if we if we narrow it down to writing, I'll ask the question, what makes good writing? And somebody will put out a they'll put out an answer, and it'll be really simple, and it'll be like, um, it it it, it copies speech, it copies how people talk, and it's just like, well, sure, to a certain degree, uh, copying how people talk does make good writing, right? But at the same time, we don't. We don't write exactly how people talk, and that wouldn't actually be good to do because it would be very scattered. It would be very um, – there would be a lot of ums and stuff in there. It would be very disorganized. There were, there would be trails of thought. And in some cases, we're, we're getting closer to writing the way people talk or perhaps how people think. But it's not even that too because people don't think in complete thoughts either. We don't have this one thorough – uh, we don't have this one line of thinking that goes through our head. We also, we think we do, but I, I don't think we do. Uh, I think that we actually veer off in the same way that we speak. I think that our thinking is very similar to how we talk. And we'll go and we'll go off on a tangent and we'll come back to where we were. And we'll go off on another tangent, etc. And we'll keep on doing that. Um, so I don't think that there's, I've never heard an answer to the question, what makes good art that's satisfying, right? Um when I do think about those questions, what needs to happen? So the, a, an answer that would be satisfying to me would be one that I can compare to reality, right? It would be like, okay, so I have got this question and let's just say that somebody is, um, I'm talking to somebody and say, what makes good writing? Let's narrow it down there again. And, and somebody's like, well, uh, and this is probably what I would go to, even though I don't think it's a complete answer. <laughs> Somebody would maybe go down to, well, there's a basic logic to thinking and language and how people function in the world and how people think, how people make sense of their world and, and how they make sense of the world is through language and through talking, even if it's just talking to themselves, that's really, really how, that's really how we think. We do a lot of talking in words. Um, and because we, we have this specific logic that goes into it, and what we're trying to do with writing is we are, um, if just the craft of writing, right? We're not talking about um, storytelling. We're not talking about narratives or, or characters or anything like that. But if we get down to the core of writing, then uh, maybe this hypothetical person would say, well, we've got this logic to thought. We've got this logic to language, and we're following that logic to thought and language. And I'd be like, yeah, that seems to fit pretty well. I don't think it's the answer, right? I don't think that's the full picture. I think it's a bit more complex, but I think that's a, that at least seems like a way to start. So I always try to compare it to reality because uh, not all writing matches up with exactly how we talk. And in some cases, we don't write how we talk at all, um, how we talk or not even how other people talk. In some cases, you've got uh, characters like Yoda, right, who talk backwards, but the char it fits with the character, and it's not bad writing that they talk backwards, or you have a certain writing that comes across as very robotic. You have writing that comes across, there's, um, I would say that for creative writing, you don't want scientific writing and creative writing to look similar. Scientific writing is typically very dry and straightforward, but there is a good type of scientific writing. Most scientists can't write worth a worth a darn. They aren't good at it at all. I've read enough scientific papers to be like, oh my goodness, these these people don't know what they're doing with their writing. Um, but they, there is a type of writing that you would apply to academics, right? It would be more logical. It would be more straightforward. It's presenting, presenting facts. It's presenting arguments and different things like that. And you need that embedded into there. And there's another type that you apply toward. Um, there's another type that you apply toward creative writing, right? It, it's more um, fluid. It's more dynamic, and you can you can go, you can mimic how people talk and go off on tangents. You um, you can mimic how people act, and you can have somebody do something random in creative writing. You can have somebody 
uh, think something random. You can actually give a character an action without giving them an action at all, um, which gets you know, a bit more complex into cre the creative writing aspect of things. But um, there's different ways of doing things, but we're um, and we need to, if we're looking at, oh, creative writing versus the other type of writing, we need to look at those things which are, um, which are connected, right? Um, which are central to those areas. So with creative writing, it would seem like, oh, it's, it's the human experience. And then with um, scientific writing, it would seem like, oh, logic, right? It would seem to be the case that, oh, we need to central. Uh, it's how people think through talking or writing. It's how people think through language, but it's also embedded in logic and reasoning, which are the same thing. It doesn't matter. And um, argumentation and different things like that. Facts, facts, things we can touch, things we can feel, measurements, right? That's the scientific side of things. Creative side of, side of things doesn't really, it can deal with measurements. It can deal with those actual facts, but it, it doesn't have to. It usually doesn't in, in most cases. But then we go back to this idea of, um, we go back to this idea of, okay, what connects those two things together? And that's where it gets difficult. Um, going back to the question of what is art? One of the reasons why it's hard to, what makes good art? One of the reasons why it's hard to say, hey, this makes good art is because it's hard to define art. It's hard to say this is what art is. And um, it becomes easier to do that when we do focus on one area. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to be defining one specific area. But um, if I think about, because we we, if we see something, we label something. We're like that is art, right? Um, we see something that is just profound or it's beautiful or something like that. It's create. It's created by a person. We know that much, right? It's created by a person. It's put out and we're like. That's art. And even in some cases, people are like, wow, the world is art, right? Nature is art, um, which I, I would actually disagree, but that's for another podcast episode. Um, but people would say, oh, yeah, that's amazing. That that thing I'm looking at right now is art. And they see it as art. They see it as special. And we know that art is special. Or at the very least, um, the majority of us, I think, think art should be special. But at the same time, if you sat down with any of those people and you said, hey, what makes that art? Um, would they just say, oh, that's, it's just really special. Oh, it moves me. Is, is the fact that something moves me, is that what, it, what makes it art, right? Um, and I would argue, well, there's a lot of things that affect you in life. There's a lot of things that maybe move you emotionally. If you are, um, if you are talking to somebody and you're having a really good conversation, that might move you emotionally, but that's not art. I don't think anybody would, anybody would consider that art. Uh, you might be moved by a really good meal, and some people would consider that art, and some people might not consider that art. And then you might get moved by something that is created that isn't meant to be art, right? You might... Um, <laughs> You might have an experience because you're on a boat. You might, um, and you're moved by that. But you're also looking at the boat. You you can't have the same experience. For me, I really like sailing. So you go sailing. Sailing is a. Uh, I love the experience of sailing, and the experience of sailing can't happen without the sailboat. But I I would have never. I would never consider the sailboats I've been on as art. They're very. Um, they are there for the utility of sailing. They're there so you can have the ability to sail. So uh, there, it's hard to define it. And when some people would say, oh, this is what it is. And, you know, that's how it is. But for me, I, I always people like I said before with writing, people say that. And I'm always like, well, I don't know about that. I, I don't know. Um, I don't really understand how that really works. Right. Maybe I'm just too stupid. Uh, maybe it's not a good answer. It could be both. Right. It's not mutually exclusive. But what seems to be, be the case at the very least is that art um is embedded in the human experience. Um, what I've always defined it as, or what I've defined it as for a while, not always, I haven't been defining this as since I've been five years old. I was seven when I defined it this way, but what I've always defined it as is, is um, something created that conveys a meaningful aspect of, of the human experience, but that's not even the full picture. That's just grasping at what's going on here. Um, there, there's an internal logic to it and different things. There's so much more to it. That's the, that's the issue. I have this answer and I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't work because maybe there's certain things that fit into this definition that I'm giving it or maybe there's certain things in art that don't actually um, 
fit into this definition. So there's things outside of art that fit into the definition and there's things um, in art that don't. And the ones in art that don't fit into the definition are actually more important for figuring out what the definition is than the ones that aren't because we're trying to what we're trying to do when we're looking at this is we're trying to find something that connects all these pieces together and part of me thinks we can't part of me thinks we can't um but what that does is, is that just gives a definition to art rather than helps us understand what it is and is not and that seems what i just said seems contradictory but um what i mean by that is that when you define something you're saying this is what it is and this is what it isn't. Uh, if you are giving something definition, right? If you are working out your body and you're getting definition, you're getting more defined, you have your you have a clearer shape, uh, not necessarily, but your shape is sharper. So if you're defining something, I think of it as you're putting a fence, a fence around it. You're saying inside this fence is art and outside this fence is not art. But what is... Um, so in most cases, giving something a definition would be good because it would help us see what is art and what isn't. But in this case, I don't think it helps us understand what is art and what is not because I think the definitions don't work. I, I don't think the definitions go far enough. I don't think the definitions, I, I have never heard of a definition of art that is capable of actually encompassing all the different aspects of it. Um, and, and you have to really... It seems to be the case that art is too big to just give a definition to say this is what it is and therefore since we just have a definition of it we can understand whatever but um it's big it's bigger than just a definition that's what i'm trying to say in art we have painting sculptures writing music television uh movies we have stage plays ever, all these different types of things and if we say oh art is what's my definition again uh art is a something created that conveys a meaningful aspect of human experience. Well, if I say that and I, I don't have this 20 page essay about um, painting, then you're not really understanding that aspect of art. Or if I don't have a, a 3000 page book on art and everything that it encompasses, um, then you really don't understand it fully. You just have this really bare minimum understanding of what's going on with it too. So the definition is made to define it. The definition isn't capable, or at least it seems it's not capable of defining it. And at the same time, um, at the same time, it's too big. It's We need to explain it more to help people understand what it is. Um, I've heard of authors and they and there's, uh, I can't remember what author said this, but, but uh, the author says, oh, when people ask me what my book's about, the author um, said, oh, yeah, if I knew what my book, if I could tell you what my book is about in like a sentence, I wouldn't need to write the book. You know, the reason why I need to write the book is because I actually need to explain, I actually need to um, flesh out what it's about in the 300 pages I have or whatever it is. So you can't actually explain it. And I feel like that follows... Um, <laughs> That follows um, similarly in art, where it's like, yeah, I can give you a definition of art, but if you really need to understand what art is, first of all, I need to go into probably hour upon hour of, um, of a uh, podcast or a book, and I need to explain it, and I need to get into all these little different details about, oh, this is what we think may be art, and this is what we think might not be art, and this is why we think it is, and this is why we don't think it is, and this is how it affects people, and this is how people define it, and all these different things. It's really a collective, I think it's a collective thing we're doing of saying, hey, this is what is art and this is what isn't. Uh, but part of me still thinks it's there's this thing called art that isn't dependent on us, right? It's weird. Okay, so we create art. I would say that that's, I would say that I would list that as part of the definition. Humans create art. So the creation of art is dependent upon humans. But what is art or not is not dependent upon humans after it's been created. After, uh that's what I want to lean toward, but I don't even know if that's true, right? Um, so once something comes into being art, it doesn't suddenly not become art because we all agree that it isn't art. I still think it continues to be art, despite the fact that everybody might be saying, no, nah, this isn't art, um, which I think we, it's how we approach art, I think is important and how we approach art um speaks to how we treat the past i think you know we treat uh you can disrespect the past you can be like well that's stupid because it came from hundreds of years ago or you can say hey you know this is something that 
has been created that's amazing that's what's withstood the test of time and you have a reverence for it and you can have issues with the past you can have issues with how people did things i would i think you would have less issues with people in the past if you actually understood history uh, because it gives nuance to it doesn't like forgive what people did in the past because it was much more brutal but it, it um it gives clarity to why things were the way they were right so that's what i'm trying to say but um yeah so when I'm talking about this, uh, it seems it seems to be the case that it's it's by itself, but that's beside the point as well. So one thing that I think is uh, art, how art is different than other things is that um, it connects us, it connects to us on a deep level. It seems to be the case that art connects to us on a deep level. Devil, or maybe it maybe it's best to say this: art is probably the one thing that is just a physical object that connects to, to us in a way that that is living right um in a way that is human because we have things that interact with us we have computers uh we have television we have music we have well music is part of art i would say we have radio and all these different things that we can kind of interact with but i think art besides just interacting with us and get, giving us information different things like that besides just reading a newspaper i think it really um we get information from those things but i think that this affects us on a deeper level uh, this has a bigger impact on us. This affects us on, on a basic human level. I think that's what art is really doing. It connects to us on a deep level. It's something outside of our actual experience. Or, I mean, I guess we could experience what the art is trying to convey as well. Um, it's something outside of our actual experience that th that affects in a way that is a notable, a notable experience would. Right? Um, so I always say, I always say that... Um, Art is embedded in the human experience. Um, we're going a little farther with this. Art is something um, that connects us to something deeper in the human experience. Art is something outside of our own actual experiences. You know, it might be similar to our experiences, but that art is different than our experiences because somebody else had that experience and then they created art through that experience does that that make sense they're actually using their experience like you have to use your own experiences in some capacity to create some form of art even if that is fantasy art and um that is connecting to us in a way that a notable experience would so it makes sense with stories because if i'm telling a story people are swept up in the drama of the drama of the story and i might be telling a story that's true right i might be telling the story uh if you saw I think it's the darkest, you know, the Winston Churchill movie where it tells about how he became prime minister and um, declaring war on Germany and different things like that. Well, you get swept up in that experience of what was happening at that time. And maybe it isn't perfect how it's telling that story. Maybe you can't understand it fully, but you're still understanding it to a certain degree. And I think that um, storytellers do that. People who are writing books, people who are writing novels are doing that. And even if they're writing novels that aren't true, they're taking their own experiences and they're, they're distilling it down to basic ideas that are, are uh, basic abstractions, like they're, they're abstracting it, they're making it really basic, and then they're putting those basic things into the story and people are still able to understand certain experiences through those stories. Um, so there's... Some people would say, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. Um, what seems to be the case also with art is that it doesn't have to necessarily be perfectly analogous to our world. Um, here's some artists, and you may say these artists are good, and you may say these artists are bad, but it seems to be the case that a lot of people have agreed that these artists are good. And some of these artists, I think, are good based on my own experiences. Um, I always have this caveat that some art may seem better to you based on your experiences than others, right? If you know music really well, you're going to appreciate really, 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 really good music more than I do because I don't know that much about music. If you know writing really well, you're going to appreciate really, really, really good writing better than someone who doesn't know writing at all. I'm going to appreciate writing better than a five-year-old who has just learned how to write and read. Um, Go Dog Go is not as good as Shakespeare, definitely not as good as Shakespeare. Uh, Go Dog Go is not as good as many, many things. So um, here's some meaning. Here's art with meaning, right? There's art with meaning. Um, Van Gogh, and I would say it has a lot. There's a lot of meaning behind his art, even though um, he's not making statements directly. Picasso, who did really make statements directly. Lincoln and the Bardo, which sweeps you up. If you haven't read the book, it's very odd. It's very interesting. It's really, really good writing. So. Um, yeah, I, Brandon Sanderson wrote that, I think, right? 
uh, Lincoln and the Bardo is extremely good writing, and it sweeps you up in a way that feels that, like, to me, it felt as if I was there. Um, there's a artist who made a sky wall, it made a wall of, uh, it made a wall, and it looks like clouds, but it's all made of straws, and it's kind of this cool, it feels like you're outside, it feels like this, it's a, it's, it is an experience being conveyed to you, it's, it's actually, it almost seems, it tricks your eyes, it messes with your, uh, your own it messes with your own vision and stuff like that, which um, I think if you're doing more modern art, you should do something that affects, that is actually taking into account human brains and taking into account how our, our, our eyes work or how our ears work and different things like that. But there's a wall made of straws and it looks like a clouds. You know, it, they're all the same. Um, they're none of them, all of them are flat. But they're all, if you stack them together, they look thicker or something like that. So you see all these things that look like clouds. It's kind of amazing. Uh, Pink Floyd, I would say, too, is art. Um, there's other, you might want not like Pink Floyd. You might like another band. You can insert the band you like there. I just happen to be thinking about Pink Floyd at the time. So all these, this art has meaning, right? Uh, but besides meaning, the art also has rules. Um, an unskilled person might be able to stumble into real art. An unskilled person who's trying to make art might stumble on real art. Um, they might just, they might, they might be able to fall into it, right? Um, but at the same time, it, a person who is skilled at the craft, whatever craft it is, whether it's painting, sculptures, writing music, television, uh, creating movies, a person who is skilled at the craft knows how to direct that craft in a way that is actually uh, beneficial, right? The person who is just stumbling through the art artistic endeavor they'll be like oh yeah you know i'll do this and then i'll do this and i'll do this and this and this and then they get to the end and then it's just this masterpiece somehow but someone who is really good at what they do um there is a certain level of inspiration i think when people make art to i think from in a lot of different cases not all the time but i think there's a lot of inspiration that comes into making art and those who are really skilled in the craft know how to approach that and take the ideas that are good and leave the ideas that are bad and synthesize those ideas together into something that's really profound and into something that's really um that really gives us a special experience um so when we talk about art there's certain things that i think you would show most people and most people would be like yeah that's really really good and i would i would really consider that art and there's other things that tell, you'd show people and they'd be like i don't know about that um one one thing that comes to mind for me is guernica uh painting by picasso if you don't know, there was the, I think it was Spain, it was bombed, um, and then Picasso made this painting. If you look it up, it's very, it's his Cubist stuff, I think. It's not Cubism, but it's the uh, abstract. I don't think you'd consider it Cubism. And uh, it looks like a 12-year-old could make it, maybe. But at the same time, um, and, and at the same time, you have to be like, okay, is this real art? Is this bad? You also have somebody like Philip Glass. So um, you have people who are really good at what they do. And you, you, there's certain things where like, yeah, that's got to be art. There's certain movies that were like, yeah, that's definitely art. That movie is just perfect. That movie is made perfectly. The the um, cinematography is perfect. The writing is perfect. The stories, how how everybody acted. Movies movies are weird because they have different elements. They they have different types of art. They have like ph photography kind of in a way, um, because of the visuals, right? They have writing definitely. They have acting. Uh, they have other things too because you want something to come across as real so you have to like make the props and different things like that and all these things come together to create this very rich uh, art form that we can consume really really easily which i think is kind of cool but with these other pieces of art that kind of um veer into the realm of i'm not sure this is art or not um we i think that when we when we approach art that isn't perfectly in line with how the world looks or it's not exactly what we'd expect right so you have somebody who is doing something so philip glass he has the i i don't know if i consider this art i don't think i consider this art i don't think this i don't think this is art um first i don't think it's music because it doesn't there's no music in it first of all uh, music is ordered music requires skill this doesn't require any skill whatsoever there's no order in this whatsoever um there's vi minimal tiny bit of or order i guess but not very much but there's like a philip glass piece and he's this um i guess an avant-garde composer 
and he sits at the piano for like three minutes and 37 seconds something like that it's called like three minutes and 37 seconds of silence and uh i would say that isn't art but i still think there's a i still think you can have the conversation i think the conversation is had too often i think we should bring ourselves back toward um things that are more traditionally thought of as art when we have the conversation and we can talk about those other things once in a while but um you, you ask that question and when you run into things that aren't photorealistic or run into things that don't, don't follow um, what seems to be the, like what should be the case, right? If you have a musician who uh, doesn't keep a time signature, we've got to ask ourselves, well, is that art and is that good art? And if it is really good art, why is it really good art? Um, but when you run into this stuff that deviates from the norm, I think one thing to remember is that that um, it seems to be the case, we think that life is photorealistic. We think, and, and what we see, and what we feel, and what we taste, and what we touch, and what we hear, is photorealistic. Did I get all five of the senses? Um, what we smell is photorealistic. There is, I, I am convinced that there's never going to be a video game, uh, visually, that you see, that it's never going to match the visuals of actually being in person with somebody else. Um, maybe they're going to be able to hook something up to your brain that tricks you, but um, I, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think there's too much detail to people. There's too much detail to reality, right? Uh, the reason why I think that is when I take a microscope and I put it up to a the pixels on a video game or I zoom in on a video game character, like the, the shot of it, uh, eventually I'll get little dots. But when I zoom in on my forehead, I, I eventually get cells. It gets smaller and smaller. Like it gets, there's, it goes on infinitely as far as we know. Uh, and that's why I don't think it's going to get as detailed because you can never, you, you, you'd have to, you'd have to write, you'd have to detail. You'd have to do every single little blade of grass, every little single hair. You'd have to do it like Shrek did with, you know, they did every little hair, but at the same time, you'd have to do that with everything and, and video games and, and maybe animated shows and movies. I mean, you'd have to have so much manpower. I just think it'd be too much work. Um, but at the same time, we, we experience life as photorealistic, but life, um, I mean, you can totally disagree with me on this if you, if you want to, but I don't think life is photorealistic. Um, what we experience is, I think, it, it, think of it this way. Okay, so it's not like we're seeing a blurry image. Some people are seeing a blurry image, but it's not like we're seeing a blurry image. It, it, most of the time when you say, oh, this isn't photorealistic or whatever, we think that it's not as real, right? So if I take, um, if I draw a cartoon, that's not photorealistic. We know that. And then we ooh and awe over these um, artists who create photorealistic paintings. I would say, yeah, that's really, really cool. They can do that. But what I'm, I'm not saying that it's less. I'm not saying that what we experience as life is less than um, what we see or what we taste, smell, hear, touch, whatever. It's there's these details that are photorealistic, for lack of a better term, at the right now. But what I'm saying is that life is not photorealistic. It's actually more than photorealism. Uh, we live in physical space, but more of us, I think, more of us exists in the abstract than in the physical space. Um, just get lost in your own head for a bit. Uh, speaking, I mean, we are always caught up in some type of thought, like. Uh, speaking in some way or whether it's speaking to ourselves or whether it's writing something down or whether it's just speaking out loud um, I interact with my um, friends my family through how I through talking I mean I can interact with them through nonverbals, I guess but really the majority of how I interact with them and how I interact with you right now right if I sat in front of this f um, camera and I made faces it wouldn't be as clear as if I just if I'm talking and I'm speaking and I'm saying specific things we live in um, we live in a world that's photorealistic. Let's just call it that. But at the same time, we are beyond photorealism, and we're living lives, and our our lives are beyond photorealism. Um, more of us exists in the abstract, as I said, than in that photorealistic world. And I'm I'm gonna just about to finish up and wrap this up. Um, but just just because. Um, with this photorealism, sorry, with this photorealism um, and with this abstraction, right? Think of it as like this. We, we are just, think of it like a computer, kind of a computer is a physical thing and it connects to this ab, this digital world. So we are a physical thing. We, we connect to this abstract world that goes beyond ourselves. And um, 
we because of that we get that meaning which connects back to the art I was talking back to art and the meaning in art that I was talking about before. But when we approach art that isn't exactly um, photorealistic, like uh, in the way I was talking about before, um, it doesn't mean that that art isn't is worse. I mean, it doesn't mean the art is worse than stuff that is photorealistic, right? Just because it isn't perfectly in line with how everything looks or sounds or if it perfectly doesn't match the rules of how something works does not mean it's worse than those things that do. Uh, because first of all, we are looking at our lives. We're looking at how we function in the world. We're giving rules to things. And uh, for all we know, those rules don't actually match those things perfectly. Our rules might not go far enough. So somebody might say, hey, you know, you've got this rule here. But I can make something really, 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 really good by breaking this rule. And what they've done is they've gone into the abstract world and they brought it into our physical space and they've had to create it in some way that is not photorealistic to help us understand that abstraction. So if you think Guernica is, uh, I think I'm saying it right, but I'm probably not. If you think Guernica is a great piece of art, you might be saying that Picasso was able to pull something from that abstract world we live in and bring it into a physical object and create a physical object conf that conveys that abstract experience. When you when you create art too, um, when you create art, it's it, it does matter whether you're good. It also matters whether you're connected to that abstract world, that that world that is beyond just our physical what we exist in physically. Uh, it does matter that you are connected to that. It does matter that you have human experiences, right? Because if you don't have human experiences, how are you going to create anything that connects to other humans? Um, you, It's good to be connected to that, but you also need skill. Now you can convey something meaningful without skill, like I was talking about before, but if you have the skill, you're gonna be able to direct it in a way that other people um, won't be able to direct it. If you don't have the skill, you might be missing something, right? Uh, you need to have both, I think, when you're approaching cr creating art, right? We're not, I'm not answering the question. You know, I brought up the, all this, what I think art is, but in the end, we got to get back to actually creating art because um, that's what we do best. So let's get back to that. You need to have the skill, uh, but if you only have the skill, you're missing the mark. You need to have the... Um... So what I'm going to end with is... Um, is if you are somebody who feels very deeply connected, like you're, you're like, man, I have all these experiences and I wanna convey them. What I would suggest that you do is that you get a skill that you can use to convey them. And if you're someone who has the skill, I would suggest that you start trying to live your life uh, so that you actually experience life in a way that is is robust and full. Uh, and that's how I'm gonna leave it. But um, like I said, I have a hard time defining art, but um, I think what makes good art in the end is we are we are actually um, we have a level of skill that is pretty high, and we also are able to um, connect to that inner world, that inner reality that that goes beyond what we see and, and taste and feel and touch and uh, hear. Uh, that abstract world that is so much bigger than our world that we actually experience. There's so much, so much. Every single person who exists on on, on Earth has this um, all these different thoughts. All these different feelings uh, they have all these different experiences that aren't just being in physical space right there are not just physical experiences they're they're beyond the physical and I think that um, there's there's so there's no end to the art that can be created from human experiences I, I'm I'm convinced of that I don't think there's an end. I think that human experience is essentially infinite in terms of the understanding of one individual so I think that we need to connect to that. If we want to make good art, it needs to have that real human experience. And if we want to make good art, uh, it needs to have that skill involved as well. And the better we can uh, take our skill and we can direct that human experience, the better we're going to be able to make good art. And I don't think this is the end of art. I don't think this is. I don't think that I'm completely defining it. I don't think I'm saying, oh, good art is just you know this abstract experience we have, and it's just the skill combined into creating something. I think it's so much fuller, like I said at the beginning of this podcast. But I think this gets us at least a step closer, and I think this is something that can help us. So if you're having trouble writing, maybe you need to spend time daydreaming. 
uh, if you don't often enough. And if you have trouble writing because you just don't have the skill, then you need to spend time practicing. And writing, I think, is uh, any type of art, I think, is really fun because it balances this physical reality with this abstract reality that we experience. The physical reality is the art we're trying to make. The abstract reality is what we're trying to bring into the art. I think that's really cool, and I think it really um, epitomizes what the human experience is and what we're trying to do, or what we should, at least what I think we should be trying to do with our lives. Congratulations, you got to the end of my podcast. So you either had to listen to my voice, or you had to listen to my voice and watch my face, which... I don't envy you. Let's just say that. But if you, uh, if you're someone who likes this podcast and you're thinking, you know, I'd like to support him in this podcast or the other creative things he's doing, creative things I'm doing, uh, you know, there's a few things you can do because some people, some people don't know what they can do to support people who create stuff. So these are the few things you can do that will really, really help me. First of all, check out my website. Check out the other things I'm doing. Uh, second, comment on things, share them like them, subscribe, subscribe if you haven't already. And the third thing you can do is give reviews on different places. All right. So, uh, the biggest thing for this podcast is going on to iTunes, giving it an honest review, telling people why you like it, telling people why you hate my voice, why you hate my face, but telling people why they should really check it out. Despite the fact that I have so many failings in terms of looks and voice. Um, other than that, if you, if you want to check out my books, grab a, grab a copy of the book, and uh, listen to the serialized novel, give, give digital copies away. That's a really big thing too. I always want to give you something that is valuable to you. I always want to give someone listening to this podcast something that's going to, going to stick with them or a book that they can actually own. Uh, and, and you can own that book for very, very cheap. So go check that out on Amazon. Uh, the different things I said, subscribe, upvote, comment, share, and definitely, definitely give it a review on, on iTunes. All right, as always, my name is Daniel Poppy, and this is How to Write Good.